I believe, page number 442. Page number 442. I know who I believed. Page number 442. Your song books this morning. Come and help us sing today. Page number 442. Let's all sing out. I know. He is able to deliver thee. Number 153. Number 153. He is able to deliver thee. Tis a grand Number 50, be thou exalted as you're turning to page 50. 
recognize some folks who are getting just a little bit older. And some anniversaries. And a whole bunch of announcements this morning. And there will be a test after the announcements. (laughs) There will be a men's group we will be singing this morning. Looking forward to that. Amen. And looking forward to that. All right. Elsie Burks has a birthday today. Braylon Miller on the 22nd, Bo Helfridge on the 24th, Faith Ann Jones on the 24th, Evie Breedlove on the 25th, Carol Garropy on the 27th, on the 27th also Isaiah Simmons, on the 28th Amanda Kelly, on the 28th Gary Lakey, on the 28th Ember Wilson, on the 28th we have Colt Mary Mayberry. Sorry about that, Mayberry. All right. So we have these folks. Let's sing to him. The handful. Happy birthday to you, to Jesus be true. God bless you and keep you the whole year through. On the 22nd today, Gary and Tammy Lakey celebrates an anniversary. And they're not here this morning. All right, very good. And uh, also the 28th, Andrew... And Lydia Hardy has an anniversary. How many years, Andrew? Eleven. Wonderful. All right. Eleven years. All right. Well, let's sing to these couples today. Amen. Happy anniversary to you. To Jesus be true. God bless you. Anyone wanting to help with the breakfast on Saturday on the 28th, please be at church at 6 o'clock in the morning. So help with that there if you possibly can, if you want to help with breakfast. All right. And if you want to eat breakfast, you might want to show up early. All right. On the, the camp meeting starts up, of course, this Friday at 5.30, 5.30 p.m. And then Saturday, um, 7 a.m. prayer, 8 a.m. breakfast. 9.30 to 12 uh, p.m. will be the services. 5.30 p.m. that evening, all right, on Saturday. And then prayer time on Sunday morning at, and uh, on 9.30, somewhere in there, I guess. And uh, prayer time probably at 7. 9.30 to 12 services, potluck dinner, and uh, be services that night also, okay? So, um, so if you're available to help on Saturday morning at 6 o'clock with, uh, with a breakfast, please help out there, all right? Okay, um, but it says on the potluck dinner on the, on the 29th, bring lots of food. We will have lots of guests, so please help us out in that area also, too. October 5th is a cleanup day down at Camp Joy, and uh, we need some uh, skidster down there. We need some tree trimmers. We need some mowers, and, trim- and, and because my grasshopper has decided to die once again, and so uh, we need help in that area there. So that will be on the 5th. Now, on the 6th, Daughter's Day, I was told to read this whole thing. Make sure everyone understands. It says, please sign up if you think you might be coming. Daughters, parents, young siblings will be seated in the main tabernacle. Extra family will be seated in auxiliary seating. Boys will serve the meal and have separate seatings, not set with a family. All need to sign up including singles if you if you have a total so we can have a total count for food and seating there will be plenty of food for all this is for everybody not just daughters so please please sign up because folks that's knocking at the door and they need to know how much gravy to put in it amen and so please help out in that area let them know if you're coming for that okay and I'm sure there's other announcements the pastor has and so but anyway let's sing page number 50 this morning Be thou exalted. Be thou exalted.
prayer with someone today and then welcome folks to church today.
good. Very good. First Thessalonians chapter 3 this morning. Brother Dan is going to come and lead us in our Scripture reading this morning. Brother Dan, would you come? Please. First Thessalonians chapter 3. Would you stand please when you find your place there? We'll read responsively through First Thess- Thessalonians 3. Wherefore, when we thought when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone. That no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed whereunto. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you all in our faith, affliction and distress by your faith. For what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy your sakes before our God? Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Thank you. You may be seated. As the men are coming this morning, I'd like to read you a verse from Ezekiel 22.30. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. And those are the days I think we're coming upon in America. But I think I speak for all of us this morning up, that are up here, that we are thankful for a pastor who is willing to stand in the gap and be a voice in this wicked day. We're thankful for that. I also want to say I'm thankful for these brothers in Christ up here this morning. Several of them who preach the word and seek to reach people for Christ. And this morning we want to sing this song, I am on the battlefield for my Lord. And we want to sing it in appreciation of our pastor. And also an expression of our heart's desire and intent this morning. I hope you're blessed by this song. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord.
feel? Do you like coming to church? Amen. Amen. Take your Bibles to Genesis chapter 41 this morning. Genesis chapter 41. And while you're turning there, take care of a little bit of business. Don't forget this Wednesday night, Sister Connie wants us to help her uh, moving chairs and getting the tabernacle ready for Friday night. So what we're going to have is, Andrew, who was it, Brother Helfridge, you had preaching in your place? Who, Andrew? All right, you're going to bring a message Wednesday night. When that's done, we're going to have just a general prayer real quick, and we're going to start working and get stuff outside. So that's Wednesday night. Uh, the, the Jubilee starts Friday evening, as it's said, at 530. Hope you'll all be here, and we're just going to have a good time in the Lord. I did talk to uh, Brother uh, Larry Brown and Brother Ronnie Simpson yesterday, and they're going to both be here next spring, Lord willing. And... Um, they're wanting to come. They said, as long as you ask us, we'll keep coming. So I said, we'll probably do it till you die. I got a letter from the missionaries up in Alaska about the young people that uh, just got home last night. And tonight, they're going to just share the Alaska trip with you. So if you, if you miss it tonight, you've just missed it. So they're going to have pictures and testimonies. And we get all them little chance to give testimony. That'd be tonight. It's kind of interesting. But it says here, Dear Pastor Kelly and Liberty Faith Church, we are so sorry to have to write this letter to you. <laughs> Those young people were a pain from the time they got here to the time they left. We shouted all the way back home from the airport after dropping them off. They griped. They groaned. They were lazy. Had no interest in the ministry. Act like they were on a grand vacation. We wish we could say thanks, but we can't. <laughs> By the way, his brother's going to be here at the camp meeting. Him and his daughter's coming down to the camp meeting. I'll start again. Check my glasses so here. It says, uh, in Christ, it says, Dear Pastor Kelly, Liberty Faith Church, wow, where do we even begin? Having this group from your church came for a visit was a tremendous blessing and encouragement to us. Their attitude of helpfulness, joyful fellowship, and joining in with ministry and projects here was such a huge refreshing. We got so much done, and there was lots of laughter, too. God bless you all for all your generous support of God's work here in Napa Kiak. I guess that's how you pronounce that. But I did get two uh, texts from him over the time they were there. And I'll tell you, uh, they were just astounded at the attitudes and the spirit of the young people there. His brother told me, he said, Reggie, I've been all over the world on mission trips and mission things and groups and this, that, and the other, the one that's coming. And he, I, mean, I didn't know him, still don't know him, he just texted me. He said, Reggie, I've never, ever worked with a group of young people. They had the good attitudes, get in and work, no griping, no groaning, no moaning, complaining. And I want to tell you young people something. That's pretty good to get when you're a pastor. Amen. You appreciate that. And I want to thank you for being a good representative of the, the Lord and of, of the church. Don't forget about the uh, uh, hymns that the young people have sung. Got it on disc right now. Holiness unto the Lord. And they don't cost anything. They're over there in the, in the library there. But uh, let's get right into this message today. Lord, we sure do need your help. Lord, your Bible word says that without you we can do nothing. And Lord, the older I get, the more I recognize that. Sometimes, Lord, it seems like we know stuff, but we don't know. We understand, we think, but maybe we don't really understand. At least the depths of it. Now, Lord, today, I know you put this on my heart to preach. Maybe it's just for me. But I hope, Lord, it be for some folks here today that they'll listen with their heart, not just their ears. I pray, God, you keep down any distractions and anything that would keep folks from getting the message that you have for them today. Give us help from heaven as we journey on this journey of faith toward eternity. I pray, God, today for those that may be lost in this building or under the sound of my voice somewhere. I pray the Holy Ghost of God will convict of sin. And draw them to the cross and to the Lord Jesus Christ. Lead them by your goodness to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. That they would be saved, born again of the Spirit of God, and made a child of God. <clears throat> oh, thank you, Lord, for the men that got up here and sung. 
What an encouragement it is to me. I always wonder, Lord, how it blesses you right now in heaven. Thank you, Lord, for all the good men that you've sent to this church. Thank you for the folks that come, labor and support, and pray and give and witness. And Lord, all that goes on here, Lord, it just seems like I'm just sitting kind of in the window watching it all go on. But I tell you, Lord, it's been good and I really appreciate it. I pray help this church to be steady and faithful and not to do stupid stuff that would bring reproach to your name. God, again, help me to preach, Lord. You know right now I really need help from heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I want to just go ahead and say I'm a little bit burdened this morning. I do not know the man, but there's a man that I knew of, pretty good preacher, probably didn't agree with everything with him. But he's 73 years old and was um, had to tell his church that he'd been in an illicit, immoral, adulterous relationship. Pastored that church for a long, long time. 73 years old. And it just broke my heart. Uh, seemed like down in Texas there's just a scourge of this. It's unreal how many pastors have been taken down in immorality. And it's just sad. And he needs that church that met this one. This will be the first Sunday they're met. And I tell you, they need our prayers. They need our prayers. <clears throat> and um, the board of elders there, group of elders said, the last thing they said in their statement was, take heed, uh, either stand, you know, lest any man, anybody can fall. And we need to pray for each other and help each other here in the church. and Be good, be good to each other. Be good to each other and uh, stand for what's right. Ask God for grace to do right. In Genesis chapter 41, uh, this verse in chapter 50, verse number 50, chapter 41. And, I, and I'm going to tell you, I don't know how this is going to go this morning. I preached this message before. I'm going to preach this morning because God, I believe, wants me to preach it. And I don't know how long it's been since I've preached it. It's been, been a long time, I think, but I have preached it before. But uh, this message here has been a real help to me in my Christian journey down through these years. This concept, this principle of Scripture, and I hope it will help you today and hope you'll put it in the pocket of your soul. You're getting ready to, uh, we're in the middle of Joseph's life. Joseph is the greatest type of Jesus Christ in the Bible. I know of 65 cases where he is the type of Jesus Christ. So just simply seen. There are some men that say there's over a hundred types of Jesus Christ in the life of Joseph. And I wouldn't doubt it. If I were you this morning and in my Christian journey, I'd get to know this man, Joseph. He's probably the only man I know in the Old Testament scriptures that you have no, no situation where he messed up. And he's a man that absolutely takes you through all kinds of situations you're going to hit in life. And God says that he's wrote those things there for our learning that we might have hope. And Joseph is a tremendous person. Um, at this point in the story, Joseph, of course, was the uh, son of Rachel. He was not technically the firstborn son, but he was emotionally. And as far as Jacob was concerned, he was his firstborn. And here's why. Rachel was his dream wife who he really wanted to be married to. He was deceived and tricked and into marrying Leah, however you want to go on by that. Rachel didn't have children for a long time, but when she did have children, Joseph was the firstborn from Rachel. And Jacob looked at him. Now, by the way, this boy would be a great grandson of Abraham. And Jacob looked at Joseph as his firstborn. He considered him, this is the firstborn from the woman I loved, the woman I wanted to be my wife, and of course eventually was. And uh, so he's, uh, he's the firstborn. You read back in chapter 37 that he loved Joseph more than he loved his other children. You also read that he made him a coat of many colors, special coat for him. And it identified him as a specially loved son. He's always a picture of Jesus Christ with the Father. And then you read where he was hated by his brethren because of his father's affection and love for him. The Bible goes further and says that he was envied by his brethren. And 
he also had visions that God gave him of, of prophetic visions of future. And because of those visions, they hated him even more. And he was a shepherd. Of course, Jesus is a shepherd. And they come a time whenever he, God sent or his father sent Joseph to check on his brethren. Now, I want you to understand something. You know, you kind of figure family is family. You, know, you, you just can't hardly imagine this scene. But these, these boys hated him so bad that when they saw him coming, they called him this dreamer. And they hated him, the Bible said. And when Joseph got down there to check on them, sent by his father, which is a picture of Jesus coming to, Israel, to the world, <clears throat> they plotted to kill him. And one of the brothers stepped in and prevented them from killing him, but they put him in a pit. And as they pondered what to do with him, some Ishmaelites and Midian, the Midianites came by and they decided to sell him. And so they sold their brother. Can you imagine selling you into slavery, your own brother, over hatred and envy? And I've often pictured in my mind Joseph being put, lifted up out of that pit and put into chains and walking behind a bunch of camels all the way down to Egypt. Gets down to Egypt and he's sold in a slave market to a man named Potiphar. Potiphar buys him. He becomes his slave. Back up at home, they take his coat and kill a kid of the goats, bloody the coat all up with blood, take it to his father, Jacob, and says, is this your son's coat or not? And he said, it is without. And he said, there's no doubt he's been renting too by animals. And they convince his father that he's dead. And his father goes into a lifelong mourning and grief. Joseph is down in Egypt. He prospers in the house of this man, and everything he touches, God blesses. And the old Bible says over and over again, now watch this, the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. I want to say to you this morning, one of the best things you could ever have in your life is for it to be said that the Lord is with me. The Lord is with me. The Lord is with me. I have to look back now, 42, almost 43 years of preaching, and I, I can tell you the Lord's been with me. The verse God gave me that's meant everything to me in my life, Isaiah 41, 10 says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. God being with you makes everything different. Amen. It doesn't make you sinless. It doesn't make you perfect. But it sure does make a difference in your life. And the Lord was with Joseph, <clears throat> and his master's wife set her eyes on Joseph. He's a young man, 17, 18, 19, 20 years old in this time period, and she tempts him. Jesus was tempted, and Joseph refuses the temptation, overcomes it, and Jesus did too, and those things go on and on, but it got so bad that he had to flee one day and left the coat and she charged him with attempted rape and he wound up in prison so now he's sold by his brother and he's lied on by people and falsely in prison life is not being good to this boy he doesn't get to go to Sunday dinner with mom and dad he's not going fishing with his brothers He's not seeking a life opportunities and all this kind of stuff. He's in prison. But even in prison, Joseph has an amazing attitude. He comes in one day to the butler and the baker and he says, why are you so sad? And even in prison, he prospered and was a blessing to people while he was in prison. Well, you know the story. He was able to discern a dream. And later on down the road, Pharaoh was told about this man in prison who could reveal dreams. Pharaoh brings him up out of prison. He, he reveals to him this vision of the seven years and seven years and so forth. And he lifts him up out of prison and makes him ruler over all the land. After he does this, he marries a woman here, Basadeth. And that's where you pick the story up at chapter 41 and verse number 50. He is now a ruler over, he's only under Pharaoh. 
Everybody else, he's in charge. It's a picture of the reigning of Christ, God the Father stuff, but that we won't get into that. So we're going to read this passage of scripture, and I'm going to give you a biblical principle here that as far as I'm concerned, one of the greatest things out of the Bible for your daily life and the journey of faith that you're going through. And here it is. Verse 50, And unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came. Now that's important because I want you to remember this when God gives you this. This is before anybody ever attempts to make things right with him. This is before anybody comes and says, hey, we shouldn't have done what we did. This is years before God begins to move and bring reconciliation and all these things. <clears throat> Which Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bear unto him. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. Now I want you to read with me why he called him Manasseh. For God, said he, hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. The name Manasseh means forgetting. That's what it means. The word means I have forgotten. <clears throat> now watch this in verse 52. And the name of the second boy that he was born, he called Ephraim. And he tells you why he named him Ephraim and what the name means. For God hath caught, watch this, hath caused me to be fruitful. In, where? Everybody tell me where. Your greatest fruitfulness of life is going to be in the land of your affliction. But it's not coming till you forget some things. And I want to preach today an old message entitled, Where or When Will You Birth a Manasseh? That everybody, every child of God, needs to birth a Manasseh. Lord, again, help us, I pray in Jesus' name. I want you to take your Bibles very quickly to Genesis chapter 45 to show you this is not a one-off. Or this is not just cheap religious talk. <clears throat> Here's this man who had been betrayed and sold by his brethren. Hold as a slave. By the way, you don't find out until Psalms 106 that his feet were in stocks. And that he was treated unbelievably rough down in Egypt. But in chapter 45 and verse number 1, it says this. Now this is where his brothers have come, up, come down to Egypt and where God is starting to bring them back together and showing them. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before them that stood by him and he cried... Cause every man to go out for me, and there stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And he wept aloud. I want you to see this scene. It's come a time when he's going to reveal who, they don't know who they're talking to. They don't know that Joseph is the, is the one they're talking to. But there comes a time when Joseph is going to reveal himself to these brothers who sold him as a slave. Who hated him. And so he's making himself known and he weeps aloud. Now, I don't know when the last time you've heard somebody weep aloud. Most of our life is covered up. We don't let people see the real us. But most of us, somewhere along the trail of life, if there's somebody living inside, you've cried and wept aloud somewhere. And he's weeping aloud, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said unto his brethren, to their astonishment here, I am Joseph. And the first question he asked is, doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, come near to me, I pray you. I am Joseph, your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. I want you to watch this sweet, wonderful, godly attitude in this man. Now, if Reg Kelly would have been standing there, in my average condition, I said, you boys is fixing to find out that you're going to reap what you sow. I've got you a nice little cell about 18 feet under the ground. You're going to feel, see what it feels like to be in prison yourself. Joseph didn't do that. 
Verse 5 says, Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves, that ye sold me hither. Now watch this statement. This is the key to this message, partly. For God did send me before you to preserve life. Your afflictions, most of the time, are orchestrated by God for a higher purpose than he has and for his glory. And unless you and I can see from a heavenly perspective, we'll never get it. And we'll remain bitter and angry and resentful and vengeful all of our lives. He said in verse number 8, So now, it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. I want you to flip over to chapter 50, the last chapter of the book of Genesis and see what he says here. And we'll pick it up at verse number 14. And Joseph returned into Egypt, he and his brethren, all that went up after him to bury his father after he'd buried his father. And he'd already told them, hey, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Years go by as daddy dies. When daddy dies, they're afraid it isn't okay. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us. That means pay him back for all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall you say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, Forgive the trespass of thy servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. Have you ever had anybody that's hurt you really, really bad? And they came to you in honesty and said, I sinned against you. I did you wrong. And I want to acknowledge it. And I'm not blaming nobody else. I'm going to get this taken care of. I've sinned against you and I hurt you. And I want you to forgive me. I'm asking you to forgive me. To be honest about it, you won't very seldom get that in your life. Don't expect it much. Their motivation even for saying this wasn't really that pure. They were trying to get themselves set up so that they wouldn't get a re recompense of their action. <clears throat> Verse 18, And his brethren also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. I want you to listen to the, re the reaction to this man. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not. For am I in the place of God? That's a powerful statement. When you and I try to take vengeance on people and pay people back or hope they get their due or what goes around comes around and we have that attitude, this verse teaches that you're playing God. Verse 20, look what he says. But as for you, you thought evil against me. And here's the secret to life. But God... Meant it unto good. If you and I would really honestly grow as Christian people, now what you're seeing here is genuine Christianity. If you and I could ever get to where we see the people and the circumstances and the things that happen to us, now you may be sitting here today and everything's lovely, you're in good health, the money's good, everything's positive. Just put this message in your shirt pocket, you're going to need it someday. But most of you in here have seen something. But as for you, you thought evil against, but God meant it for good. To bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now therefore, fear you not. I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. How did, how did uh, Joseph do this? Anybody in here been done dirty? Cheated, lied on, falsely accused, hated, envied. By people that you've shocked did it. <clears throat> How he did this was birthing a Manasseh. And God is teaching you and I that... To keep from being overcome with bitterness and hatred and vileness in our spirit, 
We have to birth a Manasseh. And if you don't birth a Manasseh in your heart, in your spirit, you will come to be an old, bitter, crank, hateful, unforgiving, bound up person. And God wants you free from that. He wants me free from that. God also wants you and I to reflect his son, the Lord Jesus. And that's what Joseph was doing. I have preached this message probably at least four or five times. I know at least once here at church. A few times out at revival meetings over the years. In all of those times I preached this message, Brother Jerry, it never occurred to me that Joseph did exactly with his brethren what Jesus did with me. Did you know that your Bible says that when he saves you, he forgives you, he casts it into the deepest part of the sea, your sins, and watch this, he remembers them no more against you. It did not say that he does not remember them. It says he does not remember them against you. Joseph did not, he was not saying, I don't ever think about that. I, that's, that's not even in my memory. That's not what he's saying. He named that firstborn son as a representation and an expression of what was going on inside his own heart. That I am not going to go through life hating people that hurt me. And being unforgiving and being bitter the rest of my life because my own brother sold me into slavery. And I've been cheated out of the best years of my life. I am not going to live that way. And he expressed what was in his spirit and his mind and his heart when he named the first boy. But there's a great truth in that. He also knew that his life would never be fruitful if he harbored the bitterness and the hatred and the vengeance toward those people that had hated him. And done terrible things to him. I don't think there's a person in this building that has had happen to you what Joseph had had to him. I'm telling you something right now. I don't know what was in Joseph's mind, Brother Brett, as he was heading down to Egypt in chains. Bye bye, dreamer. He hears the taunts of his brothers. Ten mile, thirty mile, fifty mile, a hundred mile, two hundred miles. He knows they're not going to tell his dad the truth. He gets down there. He's put on the auction block. He's no longer a free man. He's no longer that boy with that coat of many colors. Loved by his daddy. Enjoying life every day. Sold on an auction block. Now becomes a slave and a servant. Why? Because somebody hated him and was envious of him. For no reason of what he did. For no reason of his character. Now, I can't say that about myself, and maybe you can't either. But here he is, and can you imagine him? He's getting, now he gets thrown in prison. He's down in a dungeon. His feet are put in stocks. You ever wonder what he thought all night long with his feet in stocks? God, why am I here? What did I do to you? Is this what I get for trying to be a decent son? Try to be a Christian? Try to live for the Lord? I'm telling you right now, as far as I'm concerned, this is one of the greatest stories for daily practical living of Christianity on your journey through life. Because if you can get through this life, and especially serving God and mean it, and stand for God and live for God, and not be a stinking chicken and coward and wimp, and live for God and take a stand, you're going to have people hate your guts and they're going to be right in your church, right in your family, right in your home if you ain't careful. Come on. They're going to do you like a dirty dog. If you're not careful, oh, you know, you smile when you walk in, but if you get that internal bitterness, could be toward God. He's the ultimate power, isn't he? Isn't he the one that's got everything in charge? So ultimately, I can blame God for what went wrong. I mean, he's supposed to be God, ain't he? What kind of God lets stuff like this happen to a young boy? 17 years old, get drug off down into Egypt in slavery, put in prison, trying to do right. God, I resisted her temptation. I had resisted what she was trying to do to me. I was doing right, and I wind up in prison. I wind up in jail. 
And that's going to happen to you. You're going to try to do right. You're going to try to be faithful. And it's just going to be like a bomb go off. You're going to wonder what happened to you. You say, Reggie, when do I need to birth a Manasseh? I need to go very quickly. But I want to say again, if you don't birth a Manasseh, you'll never birth an Ephraim. And I'm going to say this to you, and I hope God will give me the right spirit. But the reason that God has allowed in my own personal life to see the fruit is because over and over and over again, I've had to birth a Manasseh. The Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 13 said, I put these things behind me. And I press on to the high calling of Christ in, in Christ Jesus. Amen. What he put behind him, I killed, I, I, I killed Christians. I did terrible things. I held the clothes while they stoned Stephen to death. I was an arrogant, hypocritical Pharisee. I should have been in hell. I was sorry as dirt. Treated people terrible. But listen to me. What did Apostle Paul do? Why did the Apostle Paul have such a fruitful life? It's because he birthed a spiritual Manasseh in his heart to put the past behind him and let God take care of whoever and whatever. And to believe with all of your heart that even though I'm in Egypt, even though I'm a slave, even though I'm in prison, God is still with me. And if the devil can ever get you to think as a child of God, that God is no longer with you, He'll whip you into a corner. But if you can keep it in your heart, God is still with me. No matter what the circumstances are. If I've got cancer, God is still with me. If I'm broke, God is still with me. If I'm sick, God is still with me. If my spouse left me, God is still with me. He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And this is what enabled that man to birth a Manasseh and to know that God was sovereign. God is over it all. And he has a greater purpose than I can understand. And by faith, I'm going to trust him. So you say, Reggie. How do you, what do you, what do you, why do you need to do that? Thus said Manasseh means forgetting, Ephraim means fruitful. Everybody wants an Ephraim, they want a fruitful life. But you're only going to get it in the land of affliction. David said three times, Psalms 119, it's good for me that I've been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. What Joseph named his firstborn has great significance to what's going on within his heart. And the spiritual victory that God gave him. What he named his firstborn Reveals the depth of the Christ-likeness that was in him. Joseph had a lot of bad and bitter experiences of life. Most of my bad experiences are self-inflicted. I don't know about yours. <laughs> what kept him from having a bitter, poisonous spirit and had a genuine, sweet, wonderful, forgiving spirit and wisdom to not let it destroy him, his life? It was the conception and the birth of Manasseh. Say this very quickly. I'm going to get, I'll get done quick. Number one, you need to birth a Manasseh when sorrows of life have hit you. I would not, I don't want to go too far with this. But let me tell you something. As a pastor, it's difficult. When some young person comes to you whose mom and daddy has split up and divorced and they don't understand why God let that happen. I want you parents to always remember, before you get selfish and think about how tough it is for your marriage and how hard it is for you, I want you to think about how hard it will be on your children and your grandchildren and your descendants. I want you to think about it, what it might do to the cause of Christ. I'm thinking about the young mother who had two children and her husband ran off with another woman. And she could have gotten bitter, but no, she didn't do that. She just kept serving God. And you know what she did? She burst a Manasseh. And she said, you know, I don't understand how it's all going to work out, but what good will it do to walk away from God? I'm thinking about, I had an uncle. They had three children, and the fourth child was due to be born. She went into labor. And she happened to believe, to, I think, great sorrow. She did not believe in doctors. And she couldn't have that child. 
And she and the baby both died in childbirth. My uncle, he had a hard time. I'm not sure that he ever birthed to Manasseh. I think a lot of his life he wondered why did God take my beautiful wife. My mother said she was one of the prettiest women you've ever looked at in your life. One of the sweetest souls that you've ever known. And God took her in, in childbirth. I'm telling you something. I don't know what you're going to face in life. But part of the reason you're at church is to prepare you and to equip you to face the trials and the troubles of this life. And God wants you to birth a Manasseh. Um, Joel chapter 2 and verse 15 says, I will restore the years that the locust hath eaten. I don't know how many of you saw the picture of the guy that I met down in, in the Carolinas when he was preaching down there. His name is Jenkins. And Brother Jenkins, you're probably going to hear this. But he's the guy that was loaded with tattoos on his face. If you ever see a picture with him, he's usually got his Harley or big old motorcycle with him. But God saved that man. But his face is full of tattoos. And he'd been following on Facebook. And he'd come over to the meeting down there and wanted to meet me and wanted a picture together. And i tell you what, you're talking about somebody that God has given a sweet spirit. A sweet spirit. But life has been rough. Things ain't went really. He talked to me about problems, situations, and the reaping and so forth in life. And I'm just saying to you this, that God said he'll restore the years that the locust have eaten. God said in Isaiah chapter 61 and verse number 3, he said, I'll give you beauty for ashes. I'll give you all the joy for your mourning. And I'll give you the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Van said this morning, come into church and praise God. Get your eyes off of yourself and get upon the Lord. I would ask you this morning, listen, is your life all ashes? Is your life mourning? Is your life heaviness? Has your dreams burned to the ground? God wants to change that, and he can. Joseph could have easily said, my life is gone, my life is wasted, the best years of my life are over, but the best was yet to come. Amen. Amen. Let God birth a Manasseh in your life, of forgetting some things in the past, I tell you what breaks, what breaks my heart. I, I'm more honest with you. I, my, I, I'm deeply, deeply troubled with this nation. Any nation that becomes a child molesting nation is a nation headed to hell. I can tell you that. We're a nation that's slaughtering our innocent unborn children. We're a nation that are molesting our own children. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to say it in this church again. Don't you ever touch your own children. Your children ought to feel safe in your home. You have no business touching your sons or your daughters in any uh, inappropriate way. God, have mercy upon your filthy soul. But there are children out here who have been abused and molested by their own family members. Let me tell you something. You talk about, I don't know. I'd have to have grace I've never known about. Yeah. Me too. yeah. Believe it or not, I've had some bitter experiences. There have been those who've caught one at one time called me the pastor, and now they despise me. You know, and I and I got enough sense to know I ain't everybody's preacher, and I'm glad I ain't. I couldn't handle. I can't handle. I'm not a pastor to everybody here, hardly. But you know, if you die, I guess call and let me know. <laughs> no. But you know, in all honesty, over 40-some years, I've tried to be faithful to preach and proclaim the gospel of grace and the precepts and principles of Scripture. And I've watched in church as people get colder and colder. Can I just tell you all something? I can tell you three months before you leave that you're leaving. I'll be honest with you. I can tell you. I won't tell you, but I could tell you. I've watched the poison of hell being spewed out and everything in the world twisted to its worst end. And I bowed my head in my study and wept and went out in the field and the pasture and wept and prayed. Labored and tried to lead people to Christ. And then you turned your back on you. And this ain't some pity party, but I'm just saying, you got to give birth to a Manasseh. you got to say, Lord, I'm going to have put that behind me and not going to, I'm going to give that to you. You've got to take care of that. you got to forget the heartaches and the pain and put it behind you and know that God is working everything out according to his eternal purpose. And then after you do that, God will birth an Ephraim. And it will be fruitful, fruitfulness in your life. Isaiah 61, 3, the, what happens to those, talks about the very ones that wasted years and times of backslidden ashes and mourning heaviness. God said, I'll use you again. I'll give you a purpose and meaning in life. And it's not over for you. It was not over for Joseph when he's down in prison. You remember that. 
You let God birth a Manasseh. You say, what are you talking about, Reggie? I am asking you this morning. I'm going to show you how you do this. Now, you listen to me. You watch me. I don't care. Ain't nobody going to fire me anyway. You listen to me. I'm going to show you how to do this. You're in church this morning. You're sitting back here. And there's bitterness in your heart. And your life is not going anywhere because you've got, you've got an attitude toward people. You've got junk in your heart. And your life is as dead and as barren as it could possibly be. And you know I'm telling you the truth. Let me tell you what you need to do this morning. You need to get up out of where you're sitting at. And you need to walk, have the guts and the manhood of womanhood to walk right up this aisle and say, God, this is the gospel truth about me. I, I'm not fruitful anymore. I've got bitterness in my heart. I feel like I've been hurt. Even the pre Can I tell you something? Preachers can't hurt you. You know what your problem is? You need to look at me as a mailman. I have not seen anybody chase the mailman down the road shooting at him because he brought them a bill. Learn to watch this. I will give you one of the greatest truths to go to church with in your life. Separate the man from the message. Amen. Separate the man from the message. If you don't do that, you will blow out somewhere. You'll get hurt and bitter and you'll have all kinds of trouble in your life. Amen. Separate the man from the message. Danny, I learned a long time ago. I ain't going to give that to mailman. I, I'm able to separate the mailman from the message. Why can't we do that with each other? Amen. Instead, we're mad. I hate my mailman. I hate him. You just should have seen what he left in my mailbox the other day. But you ought to have enough. If you want, if you want your life, first of all, come right up that aisle, come out of that seat, and say, God, the truth about me is I'm bitter, I'm hurt, I'm wounded. And God, I've got to birth a Manasseh, and I'm giving this to you today. It's done. It's over with. I am not going to let it eat my mind like a cancer, eat my heart like bitterness that eats me up. And God, I am done living a barren life. I'm going to have a life that produces fruit. I'm going to bear it. You cannot have an Ephraim to you by birth of Manasseh. Amen. Now, this thing covers a lot of stuff. Sister Rebecca, I'll pick on you. I don't know what kind of spiritual warfare you've been through since Alan died. But I can imagine. I can imagine maybe some night you're laying there and the devil's taunting you about your faith. And saying, if God was good, why did he take Alan? Why did he leave me with these little kids? How am I going to make it? By the way, I tell you what you do. You come back tonight, we're going to take an offering for her. And we help her out. Amen. 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 We need to help each other. Amen. But if she's not careful, she could go from being a happy, joyful person to a bitter old woman. Right. That's a fact. And I don't know your situation. I mean, it, it could be anything from a boss to a preacher to a spouse. But I'll tell you something. I've seen kids could not get over it that daddy left. Can't get past it. Can't. Forget it and put it in the way. The Apostle Paul, the Bible said in Isaiah 54, For thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth. Each of us needs a Manasseh born in our hearts. And quit wallowing in the pity and the bitterness and the poison of bad memories. Let me tell you something, bad stuff happens to people. You're living in a sin-cursed world if you haven't figured that out yet. There's going to be stuff happening to you that you never dreamed happen to you. There's going to be things occurring in your life that you never dreamed. Isaiah 18 said, Though your sin be as scarlet, it should be white as snow. You say, Reggie, what's the essence and point of this whole message is this. Is we need to do the same thing that God does in our salvation. We need to forget that and rem not remember it against us anymore. Let God get you past and beyond the hurt, the pain, the sorrow, experiences of life. If you sin, get it under the blood. If it's somebody else, give it to God. Birth of Manasseh. Not only that, we need to have birth of Manasseh over our sorrows, but we need to birth of Manasseh over some heartaches. As I said, parents divorce, and I may repeat myself and probably will. Maybe children rebelling. You say, man, I'll tell you what, I took them to church. Tried to raise them for God, and look how it's turned out. Don't even talk to me. Don't want nothing to do with me. Don't want nothing to do with the faith that we tried to raise them in. Act like we were some kind of terrible parents because we just wanted to obey the Bible. And the devil comes along and says, that didn't work out real good, did it? As I said, maybe your mate, mate left. Parent, maybe your parents did do you wrong. Maybe your children did you wrong. Maybe church folk did you wrong. Maybe a pastor did you wrong. 
But I'm telling you something. I don't care what it was in your life. If you don't birth a Manasseh and say, God, I am putting this behind me. I'm going to birth a Manasseh. This stuff, I'm going to put it behind me. I'm going to birth a Manasseh and forget this stuff. We need to forget some tragedies in life. You know, Jacob, the father of Joseph, when they brought that coat to him in blood, he said, this is your, without doubt, he'd been torn in two. For years, he lived with the thought and reality in his mind that Joseph was dead, but he wasn't dead at all. But he had a tragedy in his heart. You know what he did? His own daddy would not birth a Manasseh. His own daddy said, I'm going to my grave in sorrow. When he got down there years later and got back united with, with Joseph and he had an interview with Pharaoh, you know what he told Pharaoh? Few and bitter have been the days of my life. God ain't been good to me. Let me just tell you something. If you don't get, if you don't get this biblical truth, you won't have a testimony. They don't anybody want to be around you. By the way, it'll hurt your health. That bitterness. Last night I talked to a father whose son died recently. I said, how are you doing? I said, I know that's a stupid question. But how are you doing? He said, Reggie's not doing very good. He said, it gets worse every day. He said, you know, you ain't supposed to outlive your children. He said, my wife dreamed of him last night. He said, she woke up crying in bed. Tragedies. I had a neighbor, and when Susanna was born, she was three and five years old. She'd love to get on that four-wheeler and sit on the gas tank of that four-wheeler and go check the cattle with me. We'd go over to that place where he was at, and man, I tell you what, when he met her, he just, like he just fell over, head over heels in love with little old Susanna, little five-year-old girl. He just, oh, it, just anything she wanted now, you know what I mean? And he just doted on her, and uh, uh, boy, he sure does like Susanna. He sure thinks a lot of Susanna, you know? And one day I was talking to one of his sons, and I said something about him like, really liking Susanna. And he said, Reggie, you know why? I said, no. He said, Reggie, I had a sister five years old, about the same age Susanna is. And he said, Dad, it said a gas can in the shop out there to wash parts and stuff. And said, her and my brother's out there playing. They found some matches, lit it, and said it's fell over on her and said it burned her terribly and said she was in the Barnes Hospital, Jewish Hospital in St. Louis for 30 days. He said, my daddy sat beside her and the only place he would go was to the bathroom. They had to bring him food. He wouldn't even go to eat. He had to bring food to him. He said, Reggie, he prayed and he prayed and he prayed and he prayed every day for 30 days. God, don't let her die. God, don't let her die. God, don't let her die. And said, 30 days she died. He said, my daddy's never, listen to me. He said, my daddy's never been to church since. Couldn't birth of Manasseh. Mad at God. He said, Reggie, when he saw when he saw Susanna right over there where he lived all the years, said it was just like that little girl coming back to him. Terrible things happen to people. Mother had a pot of bowl of stuff up on the stove. Accidentally hit it, spilled it, scarred up her child. Man down in Texas had a son living in rebellion, out drunk one night, didn't want to come through the door and wake his mom and dad up and let them find out he was drunk. So he come through a window. He woke his dad up. Somebody's breaking in the house, dark, couldn't see nothing. Said, who is it? Who is it? I will shoot. Wouldn't answer nothing. He kept trying to come in. The dad shot and killed his own son. Lived the rest of his life. Just anguish bitter. Killed my own son. I heard a preacher say one time, did a funeral in Texas, he said, got done funerals, said, family coming by, everybody coming by, and here comes the family. He said, one of his boys, all of a sudden, he said he walked up by his casket, his dad, and he said he fell on the casket, he said he took his hands, he lifted his daddy up out of the casket, daddy, I didn't mean what I told you, daddy, I didn't mean what I said, daddy, I didn't mean what I said. Bad things happen. I know I'm crying for now, and I don't mean to be, but I'm telling you something. Joseph wept. You know why he wept? Because he loved. But you know how he was able to birth the Manasseh? Because he loved. 
tragedies, sorrows, things that you'll never figure out why in the world they happen. My grandmother Kelly lost three-year-old son. My oldest brother's named after him. I never heard her bring his name up without her crying. But you know what happened at HP Spafford? We sung the other up morning. It is well with my soul. When sorrows so forth. You know what you know how you got that song by a man who birthed the Manasseh? It is well, it is well with my soul. Lost five daughters in one lick. I'm gonna leave some things out that are normally good to get in. My first trip overseas, they took me out to show me a biggest old over in the Philippines, showed me this American cemetery. I like to fill over backwards. I never saw so many white crosses in my life. Acres, acres, acres of white crosses. And I was had just started preaching. I was 28, and I think we had two children. First time I'd ever been that far away, you know, and boy, I was missing Karen, missing them kids. And, I thought how far away I was from home. I thought about my dad. My mama was expecting my oldest brother when my dad went was dispatched to go overseas. My dad was out a year and a half before we ever saw my oldest brother. And I thought about them boys that never got to come home. Yep. Never got to try to have a business or a job or home, family, children. Yep. Whole life cut off over there. And I thought about moms and dads. Getting a word from the government, your son been killed in battle. I've done a little study and done a little historical research on that. That's real hard for parents to get past. They raise that that boy up to a prime age, and his life is cut off, and all their dreams. And every time they walk out of the house, every dream they ever had about him is gone. I look across this congregation and I see people that hurt him. People's been through some tragedies. And I'm not going to drag up a bunch of stuff. And, and sister, I don't want you to think. I'm not trying to embarrass you in front of nobody. But I can't help but look out there. And I think. The little boy yours come over this morning and hug my neck. Told me he wanted to sing number 12 today. And I told him to go tell Van. He probably didn't get it done. But all hail the power of Jesus' name. I want to say finally in closing today, if, to birth of Manasseh, you're going to have to forget some personal failures. And I think this is the hardest part for me. I don't know about you, but I've sure messed up some things. You ever thought about if Joseph sat down and said, if I will, only wouldn't have sent Joseph down there. If I wouldn't have sent him down to check on his brothers, he'd still be with me. It's all my fault. Life can, uh, sometimes the hardest person in the world to forgive is yourself. I made enough mistakes to write a three-volume set on how to be a failure in life. How to, how to make stupid decisions. <laughs> I've done some things, I'm like, man, alive, and brought a lot of sorrow to me. David, he failed personally. He wound up up there on top of that roof saying, oh, Absalom, Absalom, my son, my son, would to God I had died for thee. David did some really terrible things. He laid on his face for seven days, and that baby of Bathsheba, the of Bathsheba was sick. But you listen to me. When he perceived that that baby was dead, are you listening? He got up, he washed himself, and he went to worship. One of the greatest things you'll ever read in the Bible. He said, well, how, how, he shouldn't even be in the church house of what he did. That's just exactly where he needed to be. Amen. And David, David knew it. You say, what was David doing? He was birthing a Manasseh. Yeah. He getting past that. There's some things in your past you can't help. There's some things I've done. I can't go back and fix it. There's some wrong decisions I made. I can't fix them. But I can birth a Manasseh. Amen. I am telling you something. If you don't, if, I don't know how to express it any more personal than this. I wouldn't be in this pulpit today if I hadn't learned to burst Manassas. Amen. 
What are you going to do? Grieve yourself to death? You say, well, my marriage failed. My relationships failed. Raising my children failed. Failed my finances. Failed my opportunities. What are you going to do? Waller in it the rest of your life? That's the stupidest thing you'll ever do. Yeah. You know what I'd just do? I'd just man up, woman up, and say, you know what? i got some Manassas need to be born. I need to put some stuff behind me. Forget it. Let God have it. And move on with my life. Remembering not that you totally forget it, but not remembering it in a bitter, poisonous way, but in humility and grace from God. In closing this morning, I want to say I don't know what you've gone through. As the pianist comes, please. I don't know what you've suffered. I don't know what somebody's done to you. Let's do me again. I don't think he's listening. I don't know what you've gone through. Kenny, I'm sorry I always pick on you, don't I? I'll never forget my life hearing you say that you watched your daddy try to drown your mom in a mud hole. I want to tell you I'm proud of you for birthing the Manasseh. And you didn't let that stop you from having a fruitful life. Amen. But if you watched your daddy try to drown your mother in a mud hole, you've seen something pretty rough. You know, I have a hard time preaching because I see people. <laughs> I glanced over and seen Kenny just like that. God said he birthed to Manasseh, Reggie. That's why he's in church today. Amen. I didn't say he was perfect. I didn't say he was sinless. I said he birthed to Manasseh. Yeah. I don't know what you've gone through. I don't know what you suffered. I don't know what somebody's done to you. I do not know how you may have failed in sin. I do not know the secret sorrows you are carrying. But I know somebody who can carry them for you. His name is Jesus Christ. And the Bible said in Isaiah 53, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Birth into Manasseh means that I am no longer going to let this poison my life. I am no longer going to be a bitter, cranky old person. I'm going to give this to God by faith. I'm going to let God put a new heart, new spirit in my heart. And I'm going to get where I can be fruitful. And I'm going to get to where I can have a good attitude toward the people that hurt me. Amen. I'm telling you, when I, when I read about him, telling them his brothers who he was, and how he was so nice to them. And how he was so gracious to them. That takes the spirit of the living God. Amen. That takes the Holy Ghost of God to do that. Yes. You don't do that on fleshly power. Fact. And I'm telling you this morning. You say, Reggie, what do I need to do? You need to let God fill with you with his spirit. Some people maybe treated you bad. But I will tell you this. I, I always remember Brother Larry Brown. Telling about a phone call he got one day. There's a preacher boy that he knew, and he'd taken a church about two hours from him. He said, Brother Larry, could you get down here? We've got an emergency. Brother Larry said, I loaded up. I went down there and said, I never will forget. Walked in the house, and he said his wife was sitting in the divan or couch there. And Larry said, Brother, what's wrong? Well, he said, I walked in here today and said, my wife had a 357 up against her temple. And I said, honey, what are you doing? She said, I can't take it anymore. I can't take all the stuff people say at church. I can't take the pressure of being what, I, what everybody thinks I ought to be. Can I tell you something? Quit worrying about what everybody else thinks about you. You just be who you, be who you are. You be who God made you to be. Well, I'll close with this. Back in the 30s, oh boy, farmer didn't have any tractor. He had a couple of horses, team. He had a cow die. 
And he said, boys, he said, told his boys, he said, I want you to drag that cow over in the backside of the farm. He said, I want you to bury her. And he said, I want you to bury her deep. So they drug her over there and they did what Reggie and his brothers probably do. <laughs> Got a little lazy on the shovel and the pick. And finally, they just kind of covered her up with about three or four inches of dirt. Come back to the house. Said, you get her buried? Yeah, Dad, we got her buried. He walked out on his porch about three days later. He said, boys. They come around the corner of the house. He said, get them shovels. Said, you got a cow to go bury. The boy that told that story, he said, if you ain't never tried to bury a cow that's been dead for three or four days already, said, you ain't had no fun. He said, we got over and said, there's little funny things are crawling everywhere. Now you listen to me. The moral of that story is this. There are some things you thought you buried, but you haven't. And it smells. And the stench, Danny, watch it. The stench of our bitterness. says we didn't we ain't, we ain't birthed the Manasseh we just went over and covered it up with a little bit of dirt I believe this all my heart you say Reggie you want to go to heaven why sure don't want to go to hell why sure that's why I got saved but I can tell you something further I do not intend to live my life in bitterness and in poison but it seemed like the more you're determined to do that the more things come along but I am sure glad that I got a Savior, Brother Lonnie, Amen. that didn't get bitter at me Amen. like Joseph didn't get bitter at his kids or his brothers. I'm glad my Savior said, I'm going to forget it and I'm not going to remember it against you no more, Reggie. Amen. God literally does the very thing he's asking us to. He's not asking us to do what we've done. I think I should shut up. Let's stand. You want to come? And you want to birth a Manasseh this morning and say, God, I don't know how it happens. Birth is an act of God. It, creation is something God has to do. Would you come this morning? Let God birth a Manasseh in your heart, in your life. Would you come? I fight bitterness. I fight bitterness. But the answer is not to let wallow in it. The answer is to say, God... I cast my care upon you and my soul upon you. Maybe nobody in this building needed that but me. Sometimes I think I got something buried. I just covered it up a little bit. And the stench of it keep, comes seeping out. You're here today and you're lost. You're not saved. Let God birth a new man in you in Jesus Christ. Would you come? Anybody? I want to ask you a question. Are you bitter toward God? Maybe you're bitter toward yourself. Maybe you're bitter toward pastor. Maybe a parent. Maybe you're bitter toward a spouse. Bitterness is not particular. It'll rest and build a nest anywhere. Would you come? God bless you there. Would you come? Let me just tell you the truth about it is, it's not the bitterness and the poison that's going to get you. It's the refusal to birth a Manasseh is what will get you. That's what will get you. God bless you. And my heart goes out to you today. I am not up here behind this pulpit as somebody that does it. I know what I'm preaching about here today. You, I don't know how you serve God and not get hurt. Someone has said that if you ever loved, you still loved. I believe that's true. Because the Bible said love never faileth, charity never faileth. And I believe... Love is the thing. It takes love to birth a Manasseh. God, give me a love for those people. Give me a love for you and not a bitterness.
I don't believe in trying to make things happen at a church service. The Holy Ghost don't do it. It ought not be done. Amen? Amen. But if the Holy Ghost is prompting you today to say, listen, I want to do some business with God. I want to give God, I want God to birth a Manasseh in my heart today, right now. Would you come? Would you have the obedience? Would you have the yieldness, the humility to say, dear God, I need help over my bitterness. Birth the Manasseh. And then here will come a Ephraim. Fruitfulness in your life. God bless you, sister. We're going to take up another offering tonight. Y'all get mad at me if you don't tell I'm going to obey God. That sister just came up here. I think we ought to try to help her a little bit. Sister Queen. I'm going to tell you right now. If there's, if you listen to me. If there's anybody in this church house. I mean anybody in this church house. That have a right to be mad and bitter at life and at God. That's that woman right there. Now I'm telling you. Some of the worst stinking garbage I ever heard tell of in my life. <clears throat> been done to that woman. And yet she's here every service. I want to try to help her. You just come tonight, have both pockets full of money. Amen. Now I'm preaching on money. <laughs> Let's help one another. And maybe there's somebody God to put on your heart tonight to give to that I ain't even thought of. That'd be good. Let's bow our heads together before we dismiss tonight, this morning. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm your pastor, and I care about your life. I want there's somebody here just say, Brother Reg, in a sacred trust between God and me and you right now, I am struggling with bitterness over things that's happened to me in my life. Maybe it's over your personal failures. You'd say, Brother Reg, you're not the only one struggling. I am too. Would you slip a hand up and I'll promise to pray for you. God bless you. Good grief, there's hands all over the building. Lord, see them hands. Lord, see them hands. God, bless you for your honesty. My Father in heaven, they have more hands than I could acknowledge right now, Lord. Many, many. It is a common thing, Heavenly Father. There's no temptation taken us, but such is common to man. But Lord, you said that you'd give us grace to bear it, that we might escape it. Dear God, these people don't need a bitter preacher. I ain't going to do them no good with bitterness in my heart. And Lord, the devil... Try to rob me of my joy. And the joy of the Lord is my strength. I ask you, Lord, today to grant the prayers of these people's hearts, raise their hands. That you'd help them and strengthen them and give them grace in this issue. Lord, where they've been hurt, where there's been tragedy, where there's been sorrow, where there's been personal failure in their life. I pray help them. Give them grace, O oh God. Give them the love of God shed abroad in their hearts. Do for us what you did for Paul, what you did for Joseph. O oh God, may we the rest of our lives birth a Manasseh. Put it behind us. And be able to say, God hath made me forget the toil of my youth. And God has birthed up Ephraim in the land of my affliction. And our lives could be fruitful to you. God, forgive me of the sin of bitterness. Lord, please do more than forgive. Deliver. In the mighty name of your Son, we pray, who is our deliverer, our rock and our fortress, our high tower. 
our Savior. Lord, we love you today. Pray that you bless the service tonight as these young people share their mission trip with us. God, help us to be an encouragement to each other. And Lord, when our brother or sister here goes through hard times and their faith is challenged and tested and tried, help us to have mercy on them as we'd want mercy ourselves. Help us be long-suffering. Help us to lend a shoulder they could lean on for a little bit. And God, I pray those that have never been far enough down the road of life to get hit in this way, I pray, God, bring this thought, this great, sweet truth out of Genesis 41 to their mind and enable them by the power of God to birth a Manasseh. It is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I love y'all. Shake somebody's hand three or four times. See you tonight. Thank you for being here.